Now there's more for your money from Mars. Mars gives you more milk, more glucose, more creamy caramel, and more thick, thick milk chocolate. You get more of all the good things in a Mars bar. A Mars a day helps you work less than Frank Mars was called a failure. After several attempts to start a candy company, he went bankrupt three times. Fortunately, each attempt brought him closer to inventing the Mars company that now owns $11 billion brands. In 1883, Frank was born in Newport, Minnesota. When he was just a young child, he caught polio, a highly infectious disease that could lead to paralysis, breathing problems, and even death. Fortunately, Frank survived, but the battle left him disabled for the rest of his life. At home, he spent most of his time watching his mother go through a difficult and tedious process of making fresh chocolates. He soon became hooked on the art and started to make his own. By high school, he started a lucrative business in the industry by selling bulk candy to stores in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Not long after, he started to settle down and married a woman named Ethel. Months later, they had their first son named Forrest. Life was seemingly perfect for the Mars family until Frank's lucrative business turned to a risky endeavor. With the introduction of the Hershey bar, the candy market became oversaturated. Several candy companies popped up and created fierce competition for Frank, pushing him into bankruptcy. As Frank struggled to support his family, Ethel left him and sent Forrest to live with her parents in Canada. Afterwards, Frank moved to Seattle, Washington to set up shop there and married another woman who was also named Ethel. Not long after, Frank faced bankruptcy a second time. So he packed up his bags and drove 30 miles to Tacoma to try his luck there. This time, he would take in the lessons he learned and transition from bulk seller to candy maker. After Frank settled in Tacoma, he started to make buttercream candies from his kitchen. While he was able to make a living, the business was no match compared to Brown & Haley, a well-established candy business. Brown and Haley left Frank little room to succeed, and after a few years, history repeated itself. Frank could not keep up with the competition and faced bankruptcy a third time. He later decided to move back to his home state, Minnesota, and escaped what he had called the jinx of the Northwest. With $400 left to his name, Frank was more determined than ever to succeed and expanded his product line. In a one-bedroom apartment, he made buttercreams and his new Maro Bar, a chocolate mixed with nuts and caramel. Every day at 3 a.m., he would make them so that Ethel could sell them freshly made. Slowly, they managed to make a living again and even bought a house. Meanwhile, Frank's son Forrest was back in the U.S. attending college first at Berkeley and later Yale for industrial engineering. During his summer break, he started working for Camel as a traveling salesman. One night in Chicago, he ended up in jail after plastering posters on lampposts, storefronts, and cars. Fortunately, Frank bailed them out even though they hadn't spoken to each other in years. Afterwards, the two decided to catch up at a soda counter. As Frank told him about his new venture, Forrest looked down at his drink. Why don't you put a chocolate melted drink in a candy bar, he suggested. Frank was intrigued by the idea and started to experiment with nougat. While it was invented in Italy in the 15th century, a local company created a fluffy version for candy bars. It consisted of whipped egg whites and sugar syrup instead of honey. Not long after Forrest gave Frank the idea, he launched a malt-flavored nougat bar with chocolate and caramel. He called it the Milky Way. It gave him an immediate advantage over his competitors since the nougat made it bigger and less costly to make. People were hooked and sales exploded. Within a year, Frank's business, now called the Mars Company, jumped by tenfold, bringing about $11 million in today's dollars. With his son's help, Frank was finally making a name for himself, but little did he know, it was just the beginning. Six years after launching the Milky Way, Frank opened a production plant in Chicago. By then, 
Forrest had graduated from Yale and joined the family business. He worked in the plant and supervised the development of new products. One year later, the Mars company launched the Snickers bar and later the Three Musketeers. Together, sales reached $24 million a year. But to Forrest, it wasn't enough to keep the business afloat for years to come. We need to expand abroad, he pleaded to Frank. Frank ignored him. He was satisfied with what they accomplished and was already living the high life, buying big houses and fast cars. Convinced that expanding would bring in more profit, Forrest gave Frank a surprising ultimatum. Give him one third of the company or he'll leave. Instead, Frank gave him $50,000 in cash and the foreign rights to the Milky Way. This company isn't big enough for both of us. Go to some other country and start your own, he told Forrest. Forrest accepted his decision, packed his bags, and moved to Switzerland. There, he worked for Nestle and Tobler. As a production line worker, he learned how to make quality, sweet European-style candy. Afterwards, he moved to England, and just like Frank, he lived in a one-bedroom apartment to cut costs while experimenting with new products. But despite his Ivy League degree and hands-on experience, his early products were failures. Among them included a pineapple chocolate bar. Still, Forrest persisted in creating a product that would take off in Europe and beyond. I wanted to conquer the whole goddamn world, he once said in an interview. Eventually, Forrest came up with the perfect recipe to create a sweeter version of the Milky Way. He called it the Mars Bar. People were hooked and sales did better than the Milky Way in Europe. Finally, Forrest proved Frank wrong and from then on, he became unstoppable when it came to recognizing a product's potential. In the 1930s, Forrest traveled to Spain. There he met a group of soldiers who were eating pellets of chocolate coated with sugar. He quickly realized that the sugar coating prevented the chocolate from melting. It was a simple and genius idea that he had never seen before. Sensing it would become Mars' next big thing, he struck a deal with an unlikely partner, Bruce Murray, the son of Hershey's company president. At the time, there were limited amounts of cocoa available since World War II had just begun. So Forrest asked Bruce if he could supply the chocolate to bring his idea to life. He called it M&M's, which stood for Mars and Murray. While it became one of the world's most popular candies and the first to go into space, it would take years before Forrest was welcomed back home. After Forrest established Mars in Europe, he took his father's parting words to heart. He started his own business, food manufacturers. Over the years, he turned it into a global company that started the pet food industry and launched Uncle Ben's Rice, the world's first brand name raw commodity. Sadly, Frank never got the chance to witness his success and mend their relationship. He passed away when he was just 50 years old. In his will, he named Forrest's stepmother, Ethel, as president of his company. But Ethel was more interested in running her horse racing stable, so she left operations to her half-brother, William Kruppenbacher. Only two years later on Christmas Day, Ethel passed away. She left Forrest a third of the company and another third to his half-sister, Patricia. Forrest tried to convince Patricia that under his management, more profit could be made, but William convinced her that remaining loyal to him was more important and became the company's chairman and president. Under William's management, he started a pass system for entry into the Mars plant and let it be known that Forrest wasn't eligible. Still, Forrest persisted in finding new ways for the company to grow, but his ideas were often rejected by the board. Even worse, when William retired, Forrest was shut out from the company a third time. Patricia's husband, James Fleming, became the president and CEO, and under his management, the company skimmed on expensive ingredients. Customers noticed and profits went down. By then, Forrest was already a billionaire. Food manufacturers was making an estimated $1.4 billion in sales, while the Mars company was making an estimated $350 million. But Forrest could not sit back and watch it go downhill. So he convinced Patricia and the other shareholders to sell their shares to him. In exchange, he would merge food manufacturers with the Mars company. This time, they could not shut Forrest out and agreed. 
After 30 years, Forrest finally became the Mars company's chairman, president, and CEO. Under his leadership, he changed how the company operated and its culture. He got rid of the executive dining room, the corporate helicopter, and anything else considered frivolous. He also called each worker an associate, increased salaries by 30%, and replaced annual compensation with incentive pay. By 1978, the Mars company's sales grew to an estimated $7.2 billion and replaced Hershey's as having the dominant market share. Forrest became one of the richest men in America and was named one of the most brilliant entrepreneurs by Fortune magazine. Today, the Mars company is nearly worth $90 billion and owns $11 billion brands, including Snickers, Twix, M&Ms, Pedigree, Extra, and Dove. In a rare interview, Forrest shared his secret to success. If you make a really good product that people want and are willing to pay for, money will come. This is the story of how a tireless candy maker and his business savvy son turned their name into a worldwide food empire. For more inspiring stories and advice from today's most successful leaders, don't forget to subscribe to our channel.